going there. You only got notice of that just a few minutes ago. So that's pretty good, amen? Amen. All right. Take your Bible. We're going to go to Philippians chapter 3, a very familiar passage of Scripture to most of you. Verse 7, we'll begin reading in just a second. Very simple outline today. It's something that you and I both know as we face this new year that is something that we think about, and that is that we are to forget and advance. These are the words that Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, shared. A uh, couple of things that I, I find interesting around this time of year is uh, how I have changed my perspective about uh, New Year's and New Year's Eve. You know, I used to, uh, when I was a young man, I looked forward to going out, staying up, and seeing the New Year in. I, I came across something that said, use this when you're allowed to stay up. I remember that. When I was a kid, it was a big deal to get to stay up at midnight. Then I stayed up and did my own thing for a while. Then middle age comes and you get forced to stay up, right? <laughs> and then when you get to be an older man, it's when you ain't staying up. That's kind of where I am, okay? I ain't staying up. I have a couple of quotes, and I just put them in because I love these. It's two of my favorite quotes about New Year's. Benjamin Franklin's first. He says that you are to be at war with your vices, the things that are not right in your life, at peace with your neighbors, and let every year find you a better man. That's a good quote, isn't it? Right. And then another one, Rochelle Goodrich. Past and present I know well. Each is a friend and sometimes even an enemy to me. But it is a quiet, beckoning future. An absolute stranger with whom I am fallen madly in love. We always think about the future, don't we? We, 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 it is always there. We know what's happened in the past. We kind of deal with the present like, you know, we were doing this morning running around here. But we don't know the 2024 holds. But the thing is, is that I can't control that. But as Jeremy said, I know who controls the future. But I can help self-control. It's one of the fruit of the Spirit. If you're a believer here today, it is something that is available to you when you walk by the Spirit is to have your own self-control about how you let things affect you and how you react to them. Paul writes about that. He uses a great illustration talking about sports, actually. Let's read it, okay? In Philippians 3, verse 7. But whatever things were gained to me, those things I've counted as lost for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be lost in the view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish, so that I may gain Christ and may be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my, mouth, of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. That I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His suffering. Being comforted to His death. Being conformed to His death. In order that I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I've already obtained it or have already become perfect. But I press on so that I may lay hold of that for which also I lay hold of by Christ Jesus. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid a hold of a chin, but one thing I do, here it is, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press onward toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. The great thing that I can tell you this morning is that 2024 will bring joy with it. There will be great things that happen in 2024 that make you laugh, that make you excited about life around you. You're going to have some great things happen to you in 2024. But I also, you know this as well, there are going to be disappointments. There are going to be problems and pressures. I mean, I'm, I'm preaching this sort of as a reset. If you are, had a perfect year last year, you wouldn't need a reset. There's nobody in here that had a perfect year. There are always things around us. Well, how will I be able to handle those things, those issues that pop up? Well, to stand strong under pressure, I, I have to have a focus. I have to have a decided way of living my life. Hudson Taylor said this. It doesn't really matter how great the pressure is. What really matters is where the pressure lies. Whether it forces its way between you and God, or it presses you in closer to God. That's what I've seen. 
In 30 years of ministry, I've seen pressures come, and any unique pressure is not, is not just your problem. Other people deal with it. Other people have the same issues come up in their life. And there are many people that allow those pressures to become a wedge. And that wedge pushes them away from God. And they allow it to, they get hurt feelings. And they, 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 they think their life is unfair. And God's not paying attention there. And they allow it to cause a distance between them. While others allow it more like a, a breaking point or a planet. How it'll take two dips and it'll pull the earth together over that. It, they allow the pressure to pull themselves back to the Lord and to be strong with it. The way to deal with pressure is to forget what lies behind you and to force on, to advance. Forget and advance, okay? Let's talk about it. Very simple outline. We should forget those things which are behind us. Forgive them. You know, I need to define what I mean by forget. I, I, I want you to not think about an elephant right now, okay? Don't <laughs> think about it for three seconds. No elephant, no elephant. You can't do that. You cannot forget things. They're racing. If you begin to forget things where they're no longer there, there's a problem, right? So, so if you're if you're a healthy person and your mind is working right, forget is not that it is erased. I'm talking about a helpful forgetfulness, okay? Not some mental form of magic that you go in and erase these things because you have hurts and things that people. I remember things that people said to me when I was in grammar school, for goodness sake. You know, I remember that. And I remember being hurt or, or offended. And through a lifetime that I've lived now, I could go back and rehearse all those things. I can't forget them. But what is meant by forgetting in the way that Paul talks about it, in the way that I'm talking about this morning, is to break the power of it. To break the power of it. So that it doesn't have hold of you. There are things in the past that, that, that they have the capacity to derail you or even defeat you. If you allow them to, but you can break that. Warren Wearsby said this, we cannot change the past, but we can change the meaning of the past. Amen. That's what I'm talking about. What does it mean to you? How does it affect you? What is it doing in your life? Jesus said it like this, no one after putting his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. See, the less that we are able to see the more that we look back, the less we're able to see forward. <laughs> if I'm plowing, I'm always looking back. I plow, look at rolls. And, and that is not fit for the kingdom, is what Jesus said. Looking back can destroy lives. You and I both know people today that their lives are ruined by something that happened many years ago in their life. Maybe some of you are still haunted by something that happened in your past. And it has this power over you. That is your decision. You can forget that in this way. You break the power of that. Do not allow it to have power over you. I know I'm preaching to, to, to something else. We all have this tendency to allow backseat driving. I'm not talking about your wife or your mother-in-law. I'm talking about letting something in your past drive your decisions today and drive the way that you see tomorrow. Backseat driving. I let it steer me. I let it take me away. And somebody will say something in my present life, and a trigger will go off in my life. And I'll say, oh, here it comes again. Or I remember that I always acted this way. Or I remember when so-and-so did that. I mean, you don't have to live like that. The past makes no difference in what Christ can do for you today. Amen? Amen. No difference at all. The beauty of the Christian life is that reset. That God gives us each day new. And he has given us the power to bring ourselves before him. And find forgiveness and find washing. I can break the power of the past. This forgetting, this, this breaking the power of the past has many tentacles. And we do not have time to explore all of them. But I'm going to just mention three this morning. We need to forget, first of all, I will say past success. Past, past success. Paul is using a metaphor, and he used it several times throughout his writings, of, of a race, a race course for our life, okay? Um, he says, if we're focusing on this, uh, on a previous stage of our race, then we're not going to do well in this race. Could you imagine the best way to illustrate this, a, you know, a, a, 
a full 40, okay? Let's say some guy, I know what he's running a full 40. Say after he gets to the quarter of that race, that he stops, he's after 110, he says, boy, I wore him out that first quarter. And then I was something else. Wasn't it? What's going to happen? The rest of that race is not going to be any good because we're only a quarter of the way through. When we focus on what we are doing and we want to stop and pat ourselves on the back for some success that we've had, maybe you've overcome a sin or you made a great investment somewhere or you treated your wife good for one day or something like that. And we want to pat ourselves on the back. Paul had a very eventful and illustrious past. A Pharisee of the Pharisee. He was a he did away with that life. And guess what? When he became a believer and a Christian, he once again rose to the top. He was a he, he, he was not preoccupied with yesterday and his accomplishments. When he could have been. He was a great pastor. I mean, a guy who spoke to people's heart. The world's greatest evangelist and missionary. Everywhere he went, people flocked to it. Whether it was good or bad, they wanted to hear it. And when they heard it, many of them were saved. Paul, oh, this guy who had all this power and all this influence, and these church plants around him, he could have easily basked in the success. But he doesn't do that. What's his assessment of life? I press on. I advance. I don't need to think about what good I've done. I need to press on. I thought about it in the life of our church and how in the past we've had these great events and, 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 and great things happen in our church. Many of you are new to this church. You do not realize that many years ago, the first time I preached on a Sunday morning over on that building, there were 17 people at church. Nine of them were my family. Nine of them, okay? <laughs> That's where we started, over at that church. I remember having a revival over in that little building. Just walked through it one day. We had 172 people in that building. 172 people in that building. We used to have 150 or so in Sunday school here. I mean, there was a, but guess what? Don't need to look back there. There's no need to pat you back on that. We press on, right? This is a new age. It's a different day. It's a new church. So what do we do? We wake up in the morning. We press on. That's a lesson that God teaches me out of this. I press on. I do. It's a different day. Many of you have grown spiritually this year. You've done some good things. Some of you have grown by leaps and bounds. That is great. That is wonderful. But don't waste too much time surveying last success and patting yourself on the back. I think about Samson all the time. Samson, I mean, after they, they had his hair cut while he was sleeping, Judges 16, 20, says that he's laying there and he woke from his sleep. He says, I will go out as I have at other times and shake myself free. And the second part of that verse says, but he did not know that the Lord had departed from him. Mm. It's easy sometimes to grab a hold to who we used to be and want to live there. Some of you guys, you've done great work in the church here or in a past church somewhere. You've done great things and you've seemed to settle on that. Paul says you need to forget that and advance. Like Samson was living on yesterday's victory, yesterday's strength. Instead of guarding the blessings of the day and doing what I should be doing today. And I'm telling you guys, if you focus only on yesterday and find that to be your strength, guess what? You're going to end up in the lap of Delilah, defeated, and maybe even dead. When I think about past things, I want to be sure to thank the Lord and praise Him for those things. Amen? Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. But then I go back and put my hand on the fly. That's what Jesus said to do. Learn. Don't let victory stop your momentum. That's this first tentacle, if you will, of forgetting things. I've seen it, guys. I've seen people that go through a tough time in their life. They've overcome cancer, or they dealt with a, a relationship problem that was devastating, or the death of somebody close to them. And they got victory through that, and then they just sit down. Just sit down. They, they, they take that great spiritual high and let that be it. And they need to forget it and press on. A second thing is that we need to forget past failures. This is the one we always think about, right? At some point of us, every single one of us, in some degree, been a failure. We have failed at something, okay? It could have been in your personal life. Maybe you had some goal in your life that you wanted to, to lose weight or make money or do whatever, you know, and you just never got there. You never got it done. Maybe it's in your personal life, and, 
and you just didn't make it, okay? There are other things like in your family life, maybe you blew it as a dad. You made a bad advice, and you, you gave bad advice as a mom. You blew it. Maybe your business life, terrible investment decision, or you went down the wrong road in your career, or whatever. Uh, your spiritual life, some of you, listen to me, you had, you had an opportunity, God presented you with somebody, a chance to talk about him, and talk about his kingdom, and you blew it. You just weren't ready, you were nervous, or you just didn't even think about it, which is even worse, okay? You had an opportunity to serve God, and you let it slip away. Look what right through your fingers here. Others of you, uh, in your spiritual life, you just, are just slow growth. You're just not growing in your spiritual life. You're, not the, you're the same person you were 10, 15, 20 years ago. No closer to the Lord. You're no, no greater in serving Him. You, you just want to serve the Lord, but it just never seems to happen. You know what Paul's saying and what God's Spirit is saying? You need to forget that past failure. Failure is not spelled S-T-O-P. It is a restart, okay? It is something that you and I need to see failure as a chance to move on. Matter of fact, I learned a lot of things that didn't work in my life. Amen? Mm -hmm. A lot of things. Let me cheer you up a little bit. You're going to fail again. <laughs> you are. It is our nature to fail. But the Bible is full of characters that fail. <clears throat> Jonah is one that pops up. Man, he, he took a stinky fish swallowing him to get his attention. But guess what? Out of that failure, he went and preached to Nineveh. The whole city got saved. I told you about Samson, the story, one of the great stories of the Bible. And his is a story of failure. But yet he was a judge of Israel and did things good for the Lord. Peter. Every time we talk about failure, when his name comes up, just an incredible failure over and over again. But guess what? He becomes the leader of the early church. The rock. The one that they look to and turn to. A great measure of spiritual maturity, listen to me, is how quickly you respond to failure. You're going to fail. You're going to do stupid things. How long does it take you to recover from that? Do you wallow in self-pity or do you say, hey, I've got to get it going. This is a start-over point for me. I recognize just because you failed in your past, do not let it limit your future. And I added one more tentacle to this. We forget about our past. We forget about our, our, our success. But we need to, our failures and our success, we also need to forget about grudges. I put this one in here. Do you realize what a great snare that being offended is for Satan? I mean, he has got the church just, just caught up in this. People get offended by all sorts of things these days. Guess what? You hang around me long enough, and I'm going to offend you. Do you hear me? I am not perfect. Not perfect but we won't even start there. I'm not close to perfect. And I'm going to say something that will offend you. I'm going to act in a way you think, well, I don't know what he's doing. Listen, if Satan gets you to concentrate on yesterday's grudge, he can rob from you tomorrow's victory. Do you understand that? That is his work. That is his nature. The thief comes only to steal and to kill and to destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Jesus says that rascal will take from you everything that he can. And one of the great ways he does that is by having you hold a grudge. In Ephesians chapter 4. Verse 26 talks about anger. Don't let the sun go down in your anger. Talks about handling that. Verse 27 says, do not give the devil a foothold. A topos in the Greek. A place. Don't let him buy property around you, is what that says. If you give him one spot on the map, he's going to want to join a piece of property. And he will get to worm his way into your life. It is called an open door. When you hold a grudge, it is an open door, and he will steal your joy, he will kill your testimony, and he will destroy your life. That is his nature, it's what he wants to do. Jesus, on the contrast, says, I came to bring you life and have it more abundant. How did, it, how did he bring that life? How did Jesus bring us this life? Through forgiveness. Forgiveness of sin. Jesus died on the cross so that my sins would be forgiven. Through forgiveness. How do you handle a grudge? Forgiveness. Therefore, life came 
with forgiveness. Life comes with forgiveness. See, when we think about our grudge, trouble grows. But when we think about our God, trouble goes. I came across this quote. Don't know who it's attributed to, but it's a good one. Every person should have a special cemetery. Maybe you need to get a mental cemetery. Every person should have a special cemetery in which to bury the faults of friends and loved ones. To forgive is to set a prisoner free and discover the prisoner was you. You know this as well as I do. Unforgiveness does a lot more damage in the vessel that's holding it than the thing that it's poured out of. You are sitting here today, and as I preach this, people are coming through your mind. Things are coming through your mind. The way you were treated at work, the way somebody said something. Listen, you can start your new year. This is Christmas Eve. With, by bringing that bag of grudges to this altar today and saying, Lord, I'm leaving those here. There are no value in that. There is nothing good to come out of that. So success, failures, grudges, I could list many other tentacles of this thing. But the point is clear. The point is the past is the past. It should not be the steering wheel of your life in the future. The past is the past. The past has no life. It has no lot. You cannot go back and redo any of that stuff. Nothing. And those who try to live there perish. So what do we do? We should press forward. That's number two. Told you it's a hard outline, okay? I'm going to remind you. Let's read verse 13 and 14 again. One thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. We should learn to profit from the past and invest in the future. Profit from the past and invest in the future. What I mean by that is I should learn from my mistakes. I'm not saying that. I should learn from my successes. I should learn from my grudges. I don't want to go back there. So I learn. I profit from those things. But I ought to always be investing in what God wants me to be today and tomorrow and going on. What is Philippians 3? I press. I press. We often associate that word with, with a lot of activity, okay? And, and we think about pressing like we're, we're pressing an issue or, or uh, we got a full court press. That's what we're talking about in basketball, okay? Or he's in press coverage. That's when the DB lines up in front of that guy. He's got where he gets his hands on him immediately when he snaps the ball. He's pressing the issue. So we, in our mind, when we read that, we think press means I've got to get up and get out of here. It, it does mean that, but there's more to it than that. The Greeks use this word. It, it means an intense endeavor. Intense endeavor. And the Greeks use the word to talk about a hunter after his prey. This is so funny because I do this, I, I came up with this illustration and, and because I see it all the time. And Stacey and I were going somewhere Thursday and we went out. Have you ever seen, uh, uh, the idea that came to my mind was about how a feline, whether it be a house cat, tomcat, to a tiger. How they go about approaching prey. Have you ever seen one of them? Well, there's a couple of them around here and, and they, they really love that, that what you call that thing? That burn between right outside the Dollar General with all that grass on it because little birds and the mice get in there. And you'll see them sitting up on the edge of that thing. How does a cat go about it? You ever see You know what I'm talking about, right? They'll take two steps. And they sit there. And they take one step. And they take three steps. And you just sit there waiting. So, so this idea of press, it, get, that, get that in your mind, okay? Because sometimes they'll sit motionless for what seems like 30 minutes. <clears throat> See, press is a mindset. Press is, I, I also need to con contemplate what my next step is. I need to wait for the right moment. It's a mental thing as much as it is a physical or an active thing. That makes sense to you, okay? You're not going to forget about the cats. That's all you remember. You talked about cats today, right? <laughs> so what we need to do is like Paul says, I press on toward the goal. I press on. Sometimes that 
be factored in one so that it can be contemplated. But it, it carries this connotation. You can't press anything if you're not involved in it. If you're not involved in it. Paul's illustration about this race is going towards the high goal of this prize that he talks about. An athlete does not become a great athlete by watching YouTube videos. A great athlete does not become greater than they are by reading books or listening to lectures. That is not the way that that happens. You have to get involved in the game. You must participate. Some of you wonder why you're not growing spiritually. It's because you do not participate in the activity of becoming more of a Christian strength, strong Christian than you are today. You, you have to participate. Great athletes participate, works on their skills. They get in the game. They have determination. So this, this, this thing that we're talking about, this forgetting and advancing, has this element of focus to it. An element of focus. Paul said, but one thing I do. I like the way King Young says it. He says, this one thing I do. Think about all Paul had going on in his life. Think about all the people that he needed to stay in contact with. He constantly talked, thinking about, well, that church plant over there, and sending them a letter, and getting to the next one, and finding his next church. All of these things. And Paul said, I love all things else. This one thing I do. Nehemiah is a good example in the Bible of this. This is one mindedness. A couple of his friends, Sandal and Gresham, send him a letter and says, Hey, you need to come, let us meet together. You know what Nehemiah's responsible? Nehemiah's the guy responsible for building the wall, right? I'm not sure you know who Nehemiah is. He's building the wall back in Jerusalem. He's brought this entire task force back there to get the wall built because you can't restore the city until you can protect the city. So he's working on that. And his two friends call and say, Hey, come meet with us. You know what Nehemiah's response to this? He says, I've been called to a great work here. I can't just stop and come down and see you. Why should I stop this work that I know God's told me to do and go talk to you? It's my priorities, right? My focus. They sent this message four times. Four times, mind you. He knew what God had told him to do, and nothing was going to deter him from that. He concentrated on the work at hand. He avoided distractions. Do you have any of this discipline in you? <laughs> any of it? Do you try to get along and read your Bible? Do you try to maybe go to a new website, find a devotion? There are some great writers out there with some great blogs that you can grow and do things. You've got to move past being a sermon critic and get in the game. Get in the game. <clears throat> I don't mean to lay low. Some of you, your greatest thoughts about spiritual things is, is you you leave here and evaluate well, I did a good job on Sunday morning or not. Because that's all you're going to get until you get back next week. It's not the way it should be. How do we do this? How do we maintain that kind of focus? How do we have to determine? What is the goal in this thing? He says, one thing I'm doing is I'm advancing. And I'm forgetting and advancing. What? Advancing to what? What was his goal? It's clearly there. That I may know him. You want a 2024 goal? There it is, right there. You can resolute all you want to. You can keep them anyway, okay? Gym memberships are exploding. But you and your spiritual life, that I might know him. That I might know you. Mm. You remember when Jesus sent out the disciples? He sent them out two by two and did all that stuff and gave them power to do. I'm going to read that account from you tomorrow. Okay, when he's getting ready to send them out, let's know what it said. And he appointed the twelve so that they would be with him. That's how it starts. So that they would be with him. And that he could send them out to preach and to have authority to cast out demons. The first thing he mentions is that the most important thing is that they would be with him. That they would know him. I 
want you to do things in the church. I want you to do things wherever in your workplace and everything. But the most important thing of your life is to know Him. When the desire to know the Lord, when to know the Lord Jesus becomes great enough, you will forget in advance and you will go. John Mason put it like this. We become forward focused, not past possessed. I like that. Forward focused. When? When I want to know him. To know him. To know him. When my life is centered around this relationship, my number one goal is to know Jesus. We are obsessed with our phones. I wish I brought my phone in here. We are obsessed with our phones. Would you agree with that? Amen. Okay. Some of you old folks say, well, my flip phone, I'm not talking to you, okay? You, know, you apply it to me, okay? I'll tell you how to assist that on my phone. I went over level 7,000 in candy crush. How about that? Some of you don't even know what that is. But anyway, Network, Network World reported this. Network World is a magazine that follows it says, in the new study they did, they went in and they, they, they counted touches. And a touch is a swipe, a, 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 a click, a, a, a type, just anything. And they counted those up. The highest 10%, we should expect them to be high, right? We should expect them to be high. But what they found out, the top 10% touched their phone with a click, tap, swipe, 5,426 times a day. Oh my goodness. That's a lot, isn't it? Who should expect them to be high? You know what the average was? That means we're bringing it down to us now. Us. 2,617. That means in a year that the highest 10% are touching their phones over 2 million times. Millions is a lot of anything, okay? And they're doing okay. Before you get on them and say, well, all right, they're obsessed with it. Us average guys are about 2,600. Guess what that adds up to? 955,000. Nearly a million ourselves. And, and you say, well, Tim, why are you talking about that? It's interesting. 41% of the people in this research said, now that they have this information, first of all, they way underestimated how much they used their phone. They didn't think they used it that much. But the second thing is, is that out of this evidence, they said, well, it's not going to change the way I use my phone. Because. You ready for the hammer question? How many taps, swipes, clicks do you give to the Lord instead? I mean, if they researched you and they had some way to pull that information. And you found out how often you were in contact with God every day. <laughs> Would that information shock you because it was so low? Or would you somehow be <coughs> under just under this great conviction that it revealed what you already know set here? That your desire to know him is not what it should be. How do you even know the Lord if you never chat with him? It's kind of like, how do I even know? I know anything about it. Several years ago now, it, I was at the house, and Dad's got a bunch of old books and stuff. And, uh, and I was going through one of those, and uh, I found one that my mother had. And I was looking through it and found in it a handwritten prayer that she had written. And it had my name in it. I mean, where she had prayed for me and, uh, and being a pastor and all this thing. You can imagine. I mean, how special that was, right? You know? Was I in love with that book? It was a good book. Was I in love with this piece of paper or words on it? Or? I was in love with the author of that note. The author of the note. That's what made it cherished to me. How much do you want to know? I came across this letter. I mean, it's obviously going to be a, it's, it's made up, but I just think it were, gives me a perspective of the world around me and how often I overlook it. Can I read it to you? 
I have the right to tell you today how much I love you and care for you. Yesterday, I saw you walking and laughing with your friends, and I hope that you soon you want to walk along with you want me to walk along with you too. So I painted you a sunset to close your day, and I whispered a cool breeze to refresh you. I waited. You never called. I just kept on loving you. As I watched you fall asleep last night, I wanted to touch you. I spilled moonlight over your face, trickling down your cheeks as so many tears have. You didn't even think of me. I wanted so much to comfort you, but I was not involved. The next day, I exploded a bit brilliant sunrise into a glorious morning for you. But you woke up late and you rushed off to work. You, you didn't even notice. My sky became cloudy and my tears were in the rain. I love you. Oh, if you'd only listen. I really love you. I tried to say it in the quiet of the green meadow, in the blue sky. The wind whispers my love throughout the treetops and fills into the vibrant colors of, colors of the flowers. I shout it to you in the thunder of the great waterfalls and compose love songs for birds to sing to you. I warm you with the clothing of my sunshine, the perfume of the air with nature's sweet scent. My love for you is deeper than any ocean and greater than any need in your heart. If you only realize how I care. My dad sends his love. I want you to meet him. He cares soon. Fathers are just that way. So please, call me soon. I'll be waiting. Because I sure do love you. Your friend, Jesus. He makes every day for you. And in some way calls to you to see, to feel, but mostly to know. When we know how much the Lord loves us, how could we not want to know Him? I pray that that is your focus for this 2024, okay? That you may know Him. Let's pray together. <coughs> Father God, it's easy for me to preach this, but sometimes it, it gets lost on me too, Lord. Just in the way life happens and things don't matter. Lord, stop me from doing that. Stop letting me let the things around me and the things in my past and influence hearing you, seeing you today, and following you tomorrow. God, there are people in here, Lord, that need to be saved. You are not there, Lord. There's never been that time in their life when they said, I need you, Lord. I recognize I'm a sinner. I need to be saved. The Lord, a lot of Christians in here, uh, the truth be known, they haven't grown in years now. And it can change. We have the fruit of the Spirit of self-control. And I can decide, God, if I want to know you. God, give me this Spirit of Paul who says, I, I see what I've done in the past. I see the good and the bad. And it's made me who I am, but it's not who I'm going to be. And it just advances with you. It takes a step with you every day. God, I pray for that to happen in my life and my people in here. Lord, bless us right now, Lord. Maybe we need to bring that bag of bridges up here or that hurt from yesterday. Lord, I pray that you touch us today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You stand, guys. We're going to stand.